trying a case during the pandemic. A lot of lawyers are talking about it, but not a lot of lawyers are getting to do it. On today's episode of The Persuasive Lawyer, I interview Pete Pentany, a lawyer out of Virginia who tried a non-surgical motor vehicle car wreck case in Jefferson County, West Virginia, and obtained a whopping $3.5 million jury verdict with his partner, Corey Ford, from the law firm of Williams and Ford. Because there's so much speculation about what it's like to try a jury trial during the pandemic, I thought, who better to talk to than a lawyer like Pete Pentany, who obtained a great verdict and tried a case during the pandemic with masks, with all the different precautions, and provide you some insight and ideas about how to try your case during the pandemic. Let's check it out. All right, welcome to The Persuasive Lawyer. I'm Brendan Lupatin, and today I'm super excited to have with me uh, Pete Pentany. Uh, Pete is a partner with the law firm of Williams Ford based out of Virginia. Pete practices in Virginia, West Virginia, and Maryland, and you can read more about him at williamsfordlaw.com. So for more than 20 years, Pete has exclusively represented injured people and families in personal injury, wrongful death, and medical malpractice cases. Pete is a graduate of the Dickinson School of Law, where he was the editor-in-chief of the Dickinson Journal of International Law. After law school, Pete returned to his home of West Virginia, where he has been practicing ever since. Pete is an accomplished trial lawyer with expertise in particular in dram shop cases. Pete, in fact, was part of a trial team that obtained a $2.8 million jury verdict for a family of a young construction flagman who was struck and killed in a construction zone. That verdict is the largest wrongful death verdict in the history of Jefferson County. Pete has a ton of other impressive accomplishments, in particular, a recent amazing jury verdict in a motor vehicle case that he recently obtained during the pandemic, which is what we're here to really focus about today. We're going to talk all about Pete's experience trying a pandemic jury trial. Pete, thank you so much for letting me interview you here today. Thanks for having me on, Brendan. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, so Pete, would you mind uh, telling, uh, first off, just a little bit more about yourself and your practice generally? Sure. We have a small three lawyer firm in Leesburg, Virginia, uh, which is sort of our home base of operations, although we handle cases quite a wide geographic range in West Virginia uh, and all around Northern Virginia and into the Shenandoah Valley as well. Uh, we do only uh, personal injury work, medical malpractice cases, uh, and in West Virginia, I handle dram shop cases. So unfortunately we can't do those in, in Virginia. Um, started out my career uh, in a general practice firm where we did plaintiff's personal injury work, but I also was able to get involved in a lot of different other areas of the law, tried criminal cases, uh, family law cases, a lot of different uh, civil real estate litigation, will litigation, um, which has helped me a lot in my career uh, understanding the various aspects of personal injury cases, and now uh, I focus solely on this. Awesome. Um, so as I said, we're here to talk about this recent um, jury trial verdict that uh, caught my attention because I was actually preparing in August to try my own uh, pandemic jury trial and was curious about anybody else that had tried cases and you know what their outcomes were because there you know is so much uncertainty about trying a case during the uh, pandemic and a friend of mine uh, chris wallace who practices in both pa and west virginia passed along to me your tremendous verdict and i was really excited to hear about it it was really motivating to me that look you know you can get a great verdict during the pandemic and uh, it was really uh, a, a ray of hope for me. So, so thanks for that. And I uh, was wondering if you could give us a little bit of a summary, sort of a thumbnail sketch of what this case was about that you took to trial during the pandemic. Sure. And congratulations on yours as well. I, uh, I hope I gave you a little inspiration. And if not, uh, I'm, I'm glad it worked out so well for you and your client. You fantastic. absolutely did, man. Absolutely. Uh, so I represented a a uh, guy, it wouldn't be underselling it to say he was an American hero. He'd been a, a Marine Corps fighter pilot in the 80s, um, later became a commercial airlines pilot for United Airlines. Um, he 
done a lot of things after 9-11 to help make the country safer and uh, was just driving home from bowling with some buddies when he was stopped at a red light. No other traffic around on the highway. Uh, suddenly saw lights coming up behind him and, and got plowed from behind. The person who hit him was intoxicated. There were beer bottles on the floorboard of the car, which my guy took pictures of. Um, the driver was a not English speaking uh, Mexican immigrant who was driving a company truck. Um, through the course of our investigation, we learned that this was his second DUI episode in uh, a company truck for the same company. So our case was against both the driver and the employer for negligent entrustment. Um, our client's injuries were uh, largely to his cervical spine. Uh, as a former fighter pilot, he had some degenerative disc disease that, that well preexisted the crash. There was no debate about this. Um, but the crash made it a lot worse. It had been largely asymptomatic before the crash. And after the crash, he was, he was pretty limited in a lot of things. So uh, it was kind of the classic trial of the before and after um, presentation of non-economic damages. Um, liability was contested at trial. Um, so we got to have that fun with a drunk driver and an employer who knew about it. Um, and the damages case was uh, largely non-economic damages. We had some wage evidence. We had an economist and a vocational person to talk about that, but we didn't put the medical bills into evidence. We didn't put the future medical estimate for the surgery that was recommended into evidence. So, Pete, why do you think um, the case had to be tried? Well, uh, primarily the reason was because there were no fair offers made. This is not going to be anything that's shocking news to the other plaintiff's lawyers out there, but maybe other folks don't realize how hard it is to get a reasonable uh, offer that balances the scales for someone who's been hurt but doesn't have uh, enormous medical bills or uh, clear uh, debilitation or, or disabling injuries. Uh, you have to go in there and, and explain it all to a jury. The insurance companies won't do what it takes to find out what a person's really going through. And so they can't evaluate the case. You have to go in there and put it on. So because of that sort of lack of those clear cut, big economic damages that are sort of the barometer for insurance companies, they just said, you know, we're not interested in fair value on this case. That's exactly it, Brendan. They, they don't see it as important. They don't see, you know, the fact that, for example, my guy uh, can't go out in the yard and throw baseball with his son, who's uh, a college baseball player uh, anymore. They were stuck at home during this whole stupid pandemic, and he couldn't even go out and do a little batting practice with him. That was a huge thing. I mean, my guy was a former Marine. He was a man's man, uh, but it brought tears to his eyes to talk about not being able to do that. That's meaningful, and, and the insurance company's not going to give any dignity to that whatsoever. Pete, so when did you actually try the case? When did the, when did the trial take place? First week of August. And, uh, and this summer, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the first one in Jefferson County, West Virginia, at least since the shutdown in March. First one that I knew of, although there had been a few others dotting around the county. And when uh, had the case been filed? How long had the case been around for? That's a good question. Uh, probably we'd been, I would say about 18 months. We, okay, we, so, we'd so actually pretty been, quick. Yeah, we'd actually been set for trial sooner uh, in June, um, and the judge did bump that date uh, by necessity um, just because he felt like he hadn't been able to come up with a good enough protocol to make sure everybody was safe. Um, and the defense, frankly, was, was agitating for a continuance at that point in time. Um, we are incredibly grateful and feel really fortunate that the continuancy granted was only to August and not to, you know, something like next June, which is what I was really worried about. Well, I think that's a perfect segue. So from your vantage point, what steps or measures did the court take or have to take between, you know, May and June of 20 versus, you know, feeling like they were in a place to try it in August of 2020? Well, the, the judge was incredible. Uh, the judge was Judge David Hammer in Jefferson County, and he and the circuit clerk there, Hannah Storm, uh, really take seriously the necessity of people being able to get their cases to trial. They understand that that just has to be something that happens. That's not a 
back burner issue. Uh, you know, the wheels of justice have to keep turning. So they really worked hard to come up with a protocol that was going to let the litigants feel safe, let the lawyers feel safe, and most particularly allow the jurors to feel like they could come in and focus on deciding a case rather than being worried about their own safety. So they did a lot of things that are unusual. One of the things I really like about trying cases in Jefferson County, West Virginia, is that you're in a historic courthouse. There have been uh, only a few treason trials in the history of, of the country, and two of them have occurred there. One was John Brown, uh, right after the uh, efforts to take over the Harpers Ferry Armory before the Civil War. And another was uh, a couple people who'd been charged with treason after the mine wars down in southern West Virginia. So it's an wow. old, old historic courthouse. This is no modern facility, although the judge has made real efforts to upgrade the sound system and some things. So uh, because of its age, we weren't able to actually choose the jury there. There was no room for it. So the judge and the clerk and the security staff worked out that we could do jury selection at a nearby civic center. So oh. a couple of blocks from the courthouse, uh, they had set out maybe 60 folding chairs on the basketball court. They would put in a riser. We used the sound system that they usually use for basketball games. And they brought the juries in there, the jurors in there, did a temperature scan as they came in, did the questionnaire for various symptoms and then escorted everyone into assigned seats that were socially distanced. Um, everyone was masked the whole time for jury selection. How big um, was your veneer? I think we had about 40 people um, to get down to six jurors and two alternates. So it wasn't bad. All of them except one showed up. Um, I think there'd been a pretty significant effort made ahead of that to weed out anyone who was ill in, in a risk category or otherwise concerned about being there. What, so that, I'm interested in that. What, it, what are you aware of? Like what steps had the court taken to screen out people that were just gonna be no-goes if they showed up that day? Great question. The judge sent out a specific questionnaire uh, in addition to the typical uh, jury, juror questionnaire that laid out the plan for making it safe, the hygiene plan, the protocols, uh, but then also asked that they correspond with the clerk if they had any particular concerns. I don't have any data for how many people responded, but by and large, the age range of the panel was probably 35 to only a few older than 55. Okay, so you did have a younger skewed uh, demographic on your veneer. Yeah, yeah. And, and I don't know how much, but I certainly noticed it based on the population at large in that county. It wasn't yeah. what I expected. Pete, what's the general for you know, people that haven't practiced in uh, Jefferson County? What's, you know, what's his reputation, political leaning in that area? Good question. Um, it's a small county, maybe about 50,000 people. Um, a lot of commuters to the Northern Virginia and DC area, a lot of uh, government workers, um, very similar to, I'm trying to think of what up in your neck of the woods it would be. I would say like a Washington PA kind of a demographic. You know what I mean there? Sure. You got, you got a lot of white collar workers, a lot of medical workers, a lot of teachers. Um, there's university in the county. So, so we have a lot of professors. Um, not very diverse, um, economically diverse. I mean, they're high wage earners and they're very low wage earners, but uh, ethnically, it's not very diverse at all. Do you think um, it's pretty much a mix, politically speaking, or is it more red or blue leaning? It's, it's more red leaning. Um, there's a little pocket around the university that's, that's pretty uh, much a democratic stronghold, but the rest of the county is, is pretty conservative. Um, and under certain circumstances, I'd be really worried about that, particularly uh, during the pandemic. In this case, uh, you know, uh, I, I wanted more conservative jurors. I thought that with my client being a former Marine, with the defendant being a, a Spanish-speaking immigrant, uh, I felt like that was going to be favorable to us. And do you think or do you have reason to think that the younger age range of your veneer was a consequence of the pandemic or just one of those kind of luck of the draw since it's really only a sample size of 40 or so people? It was younger than what I've seen in past jury trials there, Brendan, but I, I don't know how much of that was because of the pandemic. I will say that those who were there 
uh, seemed very clearly to be dedicated to the task at hand, not just the ones that were chosen, but also the ones on the panel. Um, everyone seemed invested in the process. Uh, Judge Hammer, at the outset of voir dire, made a really nice speech to the panel about the importance of trial by jury, uh, emphasizing the Seventh Amendment, you know, at a time when everyone's focused on particular amendments to the Bill of Rights that they like. And uh, he was pointing out that that was one of them and an important one and sort of encouraged them to rise to the occasion. And, and I think they did that. And I think um, in the case that I tried, uh, Judge Jackie Bernard did the same thing, really did a wonderful job of reminding everybody and stressing to everybody that despite you know the inconvenience and probably the distaste for having to be in court during that period, how important of an overall constitutional process it was. And I think that gets everybody in the right frame of mind, like, hey, look, I got to step up and do my duty here. And it yeah, makes a big I, difference, I think. I agree. I agree. So, so Pete, can you tell me a little bit more? Did you happen to see uh, the, the COVID-specific questionnaire that was sent out ahead of trial at all? You know, I didn't. The judge offered it to us, and I just figured uh, I, I had so many other things to think about during the trial. I, I didn't focus much on that. I don't know. I don't know what he was asking. And then you just trusted the court had sort of screened ahead of time telling people, hey, we're going to continue your jury service until a later date because of your responses? That's exactly how we did it. Got it. And then Pete, in Jefferson County, is it typically a six-person jury or was that, was that really just for the COVID pandemic? No, that, that, that would be standard. That was are, standard. Are um, you unanimous or is it five or six? Unanimous. Ah, okay. Got it. Did you lose any jurors during the course of your trial? No, we were nervous about it. The judge kept two alternates just in case. But uh, we, similar to what you've told me that you did in your case, we tried it really fast. I mean, we, we put on 16 witnesses, four experts in about eight hours of trial time. Uh, wow. Really trimmed the fat to make sure we were getting the point across. If there is any juror concerned about being there, I didn't want them to think that they were being held longer than necessary because of anything we did. Now, was that intentional on your part, Lee, going yeah. into the trial? Yeah, that was the plan. That was the plan. Um, it's probably a smart thing to do anyway most of the time, but we had a particular focus on it because of the, the pandemic. Um, and the defense didn't put on a very long case either. It was a three-day trial, uh, including jury selection, with the last day going to about 8.30 in the evening waiting for the verdict. So, uh, so it was three, it was, and it was three days, including jury selection. Yeah, we started, wow. on a, we started on a Tuesday morning and got the end of the verdict at about 8.30 on Thursday evening. Okay, so I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but can you tell me uh, what the voir dire selection process was like? Was there anything unusual about it or different in light of the pandemic? Always unusual. Uh, every, everyone was masked the whole time. Uh, all the panel members, all the lawyers, the judge, clerk, uh, court security, everyone was masked the whole time. Um, the judge had, uh, let me back up, the judge had conducted a very thorough pre-trial hearing before the trial, the week before the trial, uh, over the course of two days, um, sorting through every conceivable issue so that when we got to trial, we were streamlined. So he ruled on almost all exhibits. He uh, ruled on almost all jury instructions. Any conceivable issue was already sorted out because there wasn't going to be much place for sidebars or we couldn't send the jury out. The jury stayed in the courtroom. So uh, he took care of that. And one of the things that he did was require us to provide all of our voir dire questions ahead of time, which is not my normal experience. Uh, usually you have some leeway to stand up there and, and work your way through the questions. Um, and what he did was trim it quite a bit. I lost a lot of things that I normally would have been able to ask about. Another thing that he did was uh, require that our questions be directed to the panel at large. And then if any particular person had an issue, we could talk to them directly. Uh, and what that meant was I couldn't single out a particular person who was not participating to ask them, ask them questions. Uh, and that combined with the masks, uh, made it really hard to gauge where people were as I was talking about different concepts that are important to us, you know, when we're trying to do jury selection. Um, I also found, and maybe this was your experience as well, that the mask was a psychological barrier to participation 
it was a lot easier, it seemed like, for people to sit back there and not say anything mm. because they had that mask there. Just, it was really hard to get people to talk. And even when we were down to the point where we were making our strikes, there were some people on the panel who hadn't said three words. And because of the judge's uh, restrictions on voir dire, I hadn't been able to do the normal thing, you know, Mrs. Jones. <laughs> You haven't said a lot. I understand it's nerve wracking to be here in front of all these people. How do you feel about all this? I just, I couldn't have done that. So we were, we were nervous in, in jury selection. Um, just felt like we hadn't been able to get a very good read on, on a lot of the folks. So you mentioned earlier, Pete, that you were looking and thinking that probably actually a more conservative leaning uh, panel would be best for your case, given background of your client as well as the circumstances of the crash. Um, was, in addition to that, were there any uh, traits or qualities of jurors that you were looking for uh, in the selection process? You know, there, there are certain things that would be more helpful. You want people who are uh, in decision-making roles with their companies, you know, uh, because we had the negligent entrustment claim in our case. Um, it wasn't going to be a bad thing for us if we had some folks with spinal problems. Not that I wanted anybody to have that, but, you know, have someone with that context in their life experience to bring to bear in our case where the extent of his limitations because of the spinal injury uh, was in question. And as it turned out, you know, we, we had some really good witnesses uh, during Vardir. You know, you hope for those magical moments when someone stands up in Vardir and talks about their surgery or their continuing problems. We had a, a few of those happen during voir dire, uh, which made me happy that we, that our judge had been able to find a way to get the whole panel there at one time. You know, you've told me about your voir dire and your trial where you had uh, separate sections uh, and, and you couldn't do the whole panel at one time. I think, uh, I'm not sure how I would have handled that if I'd been fortunate enough in one of my sections, if I had to do it the way you did, and one of the jurors stood up and gave me great evidence like that before the trial even started, how I would have tried to carry that over into the other, the other voir dire sections. How, did you have any of that? So ours was actually basically, uh, there was 100 people about, maybe 95, and they was essentially split in half. One group of 45 in this giant courtroom where we tried the case was the primary uh, jury selection room. However, the rest of the veneer was in another room watching it all on video. And uh -huh. it was and it was live feed and they were required to mark down if they answered affirmatively to any of the written voir dire questions. Then if people from the sort of, you know, live feed group came up to replace people from the in court group, they would have to say, did you answer affirmatively to any of the questions? If so, they would get pulled over for an individual outside the courtroom voir dire by the lawyers and the judge. Got it. Got it. Okay. So you still would have had the benefit of someone yeah. doing something helpful. Yeah. And, and to your, uh, just to a little understand yours a little bit more. So was yours the kind of voir dire where you were permitted, though there was certain, um, you know, restraints placed by the judge, were you able to kind of free talk to the group as a whole yourself? No, no. Um, you were reading individual uh, questions? I, I could go off script a little bit. The judge had some tolerance for that, but uh, there are a lot of things I would normally say during jury selection that I could not say during this one. A great example yeah. is anyone who's heard Keith Mitnick talk about the pie eating contest example. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, I, I think that's brilliant. I think that's a genius way to start out right here and get people talking and show some humanity. And I don't do it exactly on his script, um, but I do something similar in that cut right out. So uh, why? Uh, well, first, the defense objected and said they didn't want me talking so much about myself during voir dire. And the judge, I, I think, was trying to balance everything and, and show some fairness. So I had to I had to cut a lot of that sort of uh, speech making out in the lead up to questions. Was that more though a, a consequence of just, you know, the judges ruling in general versus not as a result or due to the pandemic? Good question. Uh, it's my first jury trial in front of that judge. Uh, so I'm not sure whether he would have done the same thing if we'd been in normal times. I, I don't know. And then just to finish out the selection process. So uh, you were, you know, kind of had to stay on point with specific agreed upon questions. 
if jurors answered affirmatively to something, um, what was the process of individually voir or speaking to them? Was it done in the midst of the group or were they pulled out separately somewhere? Judge had flagged certain issues where he was going to invite jurors to come off to the side, uh, where he had, he had a sort of a side table set up. He wasn't really on a bench. We were in the middle of a basketball gym. Uh, but the side table was set up in a way with chairs spaced out around it. Everyone was masked the whole time. It was about the best we could do. It wasn't uh, exactly six feet apart probably, but it was relatively private and I felt safe. Uh, I didn't hear anyone else mention, you know, the defense lawyers felt comfortable with that process. Court reporter was masked while we did that. By and large though, follow-up questions were done in front of the panel. But because, you know, we had a drunk driver in our case uh, as the defendant, uh, questions about drinking and driving were ones that the judge flagged as being things someone might want to talk about over in private. Got it. By way of example. So how far was the jury selection location from the courthouse? About three blocks, but it was a rainy day. So every poor person had to either drive or schlep in the rain uh, back and forth. Okay. So, so there wasn't very far. Yeah. Okay. So people could walk if need be between the two places. Yeah, they could have. I'm not sure whether anyone actually did, but yeah, they could have. Okay. And so then after the jury selection process, those jurors selected then what, drove back over to the courthouse and came in and... Yeah, everybody had to come to the courthouse, go through the same uh, screening process to enter the courthouse. Um, and then we went into the courtroom. And this was, for me at least, the most interesting change from normal process. Um, the jury room wasn't big enough for the jury to uh, use as their headquarters during the trial, so to speak. So instead, the courtroom was their jury room. So oh. they were, yeah, they were pretty much always there and everybody else came in and out. So it was an unusual experience for me. Uh, you know, you're used to getting in, getting yourself settled, sort of spreading out your stuff, getting yourself at peace and, and composing yourself before the jury ever came out to see you. It was all out the window, man. Yeah, uh, you know, it was like the reverse. Both spread out. We were running around plugging stuff in. The jury's just sitting there watching. Um, they got they got uh, a view of backstage way more than they normally do. That's uh, really interesting. And was that decided by the court already ahead of time? We knew that was going to be the case, uh, and, and we intended to be as smooth as we could be. And we were, you know, aware that we were always going to be on stage. Uh, it was still, it was still hard to hard to keep it all together right in front of them. So let me ask you this: What kind of mask did you wear? Uh, you know, I just used a typical medical mask. Uh, I I went back and forth about that. You know, we're so precise. We we think about the tie we're going to wear. We think oh yeah, the shoes. You know, are we going to wear a suit or are we going to wear a sport coat and slacks? You know, we we spend all that time, uh, and then the night before trial, I was like dang, I got to think of what, what mask to put on. You know, I had a couple of different ones, uh, like we all do at this point in time. You get one, you know, that a, a caring family member has made and you get one that you bought from the store and they all have different designs on them. I, I probably worried about it too much and, and decided that pretty much I'm just going to stick with the, the light blue medical type mask. And, and, and in hindsight, are you happy that you, did, you went with that mask? Yeah, I, I don't have any regrets about it. Uh, you know, I had a couple uh, military or next military witnesses. And so when they came into trial, they had the American flags on their, on their mask when they came in to testify. And that was, did not displease me at all. Uh, but it wasn't planned ahead of time. So I ask because on a lot of different listservs, I'm seeing a lot of lawyers debate and clearly stress out about what kind of mask they should wear. And one of the uh, I think it was on the trial by human list or people were talking about wearing the clear masks so you can see your mouth. Yeah, I saw and, that, yeah. and, and as a, as a little anecdote on the side, my partner, Greg Uniton, who tried, we try every case together and, and, and we're, you know, great trial partners. He was talking about that. He was thinking he wanted to get the clear mask and I, I forbid him. And I said, you will not <laughs> wear a clear mask during this trial because I personally find them so gross because they have all the condensate and like the wetness in them. And I just think it looks very bizarre. And most people nowadays, we've all kind of gotten accustomed to masks. I'm always off put the rare times I see someone with one of those clear masks. 
And I thought that's probably the way the jury's going to feel. They're going to be used to a certain type of mass. So let's stick with what people are used to. It's interesting you say that. Um, I would have killed for everybody to have clear masks on. Quite honestly. <laughs> now, I will say this. Uh, once we got through Vardir, the judge did allow whoever was speaking to remove his or her mask. So when I was examining a witness or giving my opening statement, my mask was off. I was far from the jury. I was far from the jury. I mean, the trade-off was we were going to be set way back to avoid any potential, you know, air spread. Uh, but we were able to take our mask off. Likewise, the witness was allowed to remove uh, his or her mask when testifying. And so the, the court was great. And these security uh, gentlemen in the courtroom were awesome. Uh, they had these little covers that they put over the microphone, like little uh, like microphone condoms. And they, they put it on over the whole thing. Uh, and each person had their own cover that you put on the microphone. And as soon as someone left the, either the counsel podium or the witness stand, two of the security guys would come over, they would spray it all down, wipe it all off and make sure it was desanitized before the next witness or lawyer approached that microphone. So with those precautions, we were allowed to take off the masks. Um, but I have hearing impairment. I rely on hearing aids, but also a lot on lip reading. So anytime that someone was masked, it was, it was a real challenge for me. It was oh, wow. Hard. Yeah, I could see that being a real obstacle. Uh, and, and I can relate in the sense, not that I have uh, a hear, any hearing issues, but our trial tech support um, specific to our case, I came to find out the second day of trial, he wears hearing aids. And I had no idea that ahead of time. And I remembered on the first day, I was annoyed, you know, and I felt like a jerk afterwards because I was, I had turned back and said, you know, Eric, you know, pull this, pull that. And there was a lag and he was, you know, asking me and I'm sitting there like, what, what's going on over here? Come to find out, he relies a great deal on being able to see in addition to hear. And I'm turning around my mask because we had to wear masks the whole time, no matter what. And um, I think for anybody out there, uh, you know, even if you don't have uh, uh, any hearing deficits, I think a lot of people still like to be able to see, you know, people's mouths when they're talking and things like that. Yeah. Um, so I could imagine that that was, yeah, quite important. It makes it more important now to me, the point you said earlier about your voir dire selection, why you wish people uh, had uh, not had to wear masks or had clear masks. But I think... It's also really interesting the different strategies that courts are using to maintain uh, sanitation. Uh, and I think that idea of those little, you know, microphone condoms, as you called them, or those little, you know, coverings is a wonderful idea because that was one of the few, in my case, things that Greg and I were a little, you know, iffy about because the same way, you know, witnesses were encouraged, but not required to remove their masks when they testified. And the uh, staff was wonderful about maintaining everybody, keeping their masks on, everybody spaced out and cleaning down our tables, the witness box, et cetera. But the one thing that Greg and I thought about was that microphone that everybody repeatedly has to keep being told, get really close to, to talk to, wasn't being changed or addressed at all. And we yeah. debated like, well, I mean, what are the chances like it's going to emanate off or people are going to bump their faces on it? I don't think that's happening. But, but still, I think that's a great idea by your court to have done that. It was really smart and everyone uh, quickly got into the habit. I say everyone. Council really quickly got into the habit of just putting it on and taking it off and, and we really didn't have too many issues with it. So tell me just a little bit more about what the court's requirements of for council uh, in regards to, you know, where you were permitted to examine witnesses from, where you were able to stand during opening and closing, at what points you had to wear a mask versus not wear a mask. Yeah, good question. So we were required to be masked at all times, except when we were speaking. And anytime that we had our mask off to speak, we either needed to be at the podium, which as I said, was pretty far removed. I would say we were maybe as far as 30 feet from the, where the jury was sitting. And, and to give perspective, the court had basically turned the courtroom backwards. So the jury was sitting in the gallery where the public would normally sit socially distanced and they were so they were spread out in risers up. Uh, the lawyers then sat, the defense sat in what would have been the jury box and plaintiff side sat off to the side as well so that we weren't with our back to the judge who stayed on the bench. So we were kind of to the side of everything. 
um, because of where the witness stand was moved to, um, that meant that oftentimes the lawyers were behind the witness. Um, and so the judge gave us leeway to move anywhere in the courtroom we wanted, as long as we were socially distanced, to be able to have a vantage point of the witness while testifying and the counsel asking questions. So uh, I would say for 90% of the trial, when I wasn't at the podium, I was working out of my lap from a bench or from the gallery or from some side, moving my chair around to the side. Um, so there was a lot of moving around in the courtroom uh, and the judge encouraged it. He wanted to make sure that we, we were comfortable, that we were seeing the witness, that we were seeing what exhibit was being displayed. Um, but there were, some, there were some drawbacks to that, obviously. My, my partner and I were far away from each other at times and, you know, passing med notes and things like that. We just sort of had to get up and walk over to each other. I wasn't with my client the whole time. Normally, you, you know, you want to be sitting there, you want to be associated with them. I just had to leave him. He couldn't go wandering around with me. So I had to leave him sitting where he was and go someplace else. Um, and then objecting uh, because you were away from your microphone, you really had to stand up and, and project so that the judge could hear what your objections were. Well, that that, that's what I was going to ask you next. Did for opening, closing examinations, did you always have to be speaking into a mic? We had to stay at the podium. The judge felt like that was the place where we could be sure the jury could hear us because of the microphone. And because of the uh, removal of the mask, the judge felt like that was far enough away um, that he could be comfortable and the jury could be comfortable. We weren't you know, spitting on him while we were giving our closing or something like that. So we, we were stuck at the podium. And did you, did you mention that the jurors, you know, who are now sitting out in the gallery that uh, they were, they had risers for some of them, so they were elevated? Yeah, the, the layout of the courtroom was such that the gallery goes up on tiers. Naturally? Was that just the way it's built? All the style, big courtroom, yeah. So they were, they were pretty uh, far spread out from each other, and they had good vantage point. They could, they could see pretty well. Uh, we made sure that we were ready to blow up our exhibits really big, though, because we knew somebody was going to be stuck in that back row. How was that handled, Pete, in regards to, did you do one giant screen or what did you do to show stuff? We, we, we got access to the courtroom the week before trial and, and, and made sure it was all gonna work right. But we had one giant screen and a projector and we put everything up there. We played uh, Deben ASA video deposition of one of our doctors that way and also put all the exhibits that we used up there. And for your, uh, so in uh, Allegheny County, I, I've heard that term a lot, de Ben ASA uh, testimony. We usually just call them video for use at trial. We're kind of rudimentary over here. Um, how many um, witnesses did you do by uh, pre-recorded video? We had two and ended up not playing one. Uh, it's two doctors. Um, the one we played was about 20 minutes long, pain management doctor who was uh, really good and to the point. The other one, uh, it was a 50 minute video. Our witness had done really well. We felt like he uh, was strong. They didn't score any points in cross. But as the case progressed, we felt like we were really rolling downhill with the way the evidence was coming in. We thought, you know, let's just not push our luck and play this 50 minute video and, and keep people sitting in the, in the jury box watching that and, and feeling like maybe it was dragging. So, so we cut it out. Really? So you had one of your medical witnesses, I'm, I'm guessing just on medical damages. Type, yeah. And you decided that the case was going so well, you didn't want to bring it to a grinding halt, so to speak, and, and decided just not to play that video at all. That's exactly it. Yep. That's, I think that takes a lot of um, yeah, experience and courage to make decisions like that. But I think they're so important. It's just, you know, well, we, we, we took the witness, we got to play it, you know, but you're saying, no, I'm in the flow of this trial. This doesn't fit right now. I think we're better without it. Yeah, I wish I could take credit for a lot of the genius there. Can't. What, what the situation was, was uh, the client's treating doctor was a real nice guy, real careful doctor, never testified before ever, Brendan, never been in the courtroom. His deposition in our case was his first deposition ever. Uh, we were nervous about it. Uh, so we had, we had sort of the old pro on video uh, as well. So when the treating doctor actually came to trial, he was willing to come. He was comfortable with the precautions the court had taken. He was just a great witness. I think unlike a lot of doctors who start to see this as old hat, 
and they don't prepare very much. He, he'd taken this really seriously and put a lot of effort into making sure he was ready for anything. And he was just a great witness. And he was so good that we thought we don't need the video. He would have just yeah, yeah, one of those stroke of good lucks in the course of the trial that, you know, you get the, the expert treater who really prepares like crazy to do a good job. Yeah, it was, it was extraordinary for us. So, Pete, going into the trial, you know, versus coming out on the other end of it, was there anything about, you know, the way you were imagining what a pandemic trial would be like that was vastly different than you anticipated? And conversely, was there, was there anything that was exactly like what you thought it would be like or imagined it would be like? Um, the things that I'd flagged as being difficult tended to be difficult. As I mentioned, you know, being able to hear uh, when everyone's mass was, I expected that to be a challenge and it was a challenge. Um, what I didn't count on, Brendan, and maybe you experienced this some too, was the inability to read the jury while the trial was going on because of the masks uh, and because they were spread out. Um, it was really hard to take a quick glance, for example, during cross-examination to see uh, to what extent they responded to a particular point. Um, I try to keep a lot of humanity during trial and I normally have a pretty good sense of humor, but I, I try to limit the jokes. You know, it just doesn't seem like the right place. We're talking about serious things, but every once in a while something's funny and you want to see if they're laughing or not. Uh, you couldn't tell at all. It was, uh, you know, because we were so far away from them, you couldn't even see their eyes very well to know whether their eyebrows were up or, you know, they were mad about things. About the best you could do was if, you know, someone was, Hunched up, you could figure they weren't responding to that very well. But beyond that, it was really hard to tell what they were thinking. Did yeah, you and, and that's absolutely my experience as well. However, I feel like I've tried so many cases at this point and have come to realize that I have no clue what any of the jurors' right. facial expressions or body language means. My only indicator typically of if there was something significant, and I at least was able to do this during our trial, is if people are writing. Um, and it's, you know, if you're seeing them writing down your economic numbers or things of that nature, you'd like to take that as a positive sign, or maybe it's just the person that writes everything down, but that was pretty much my sole gauge, but you're right. Otherwise it, if it was already difficult to read jurors, it's that much harder now with the masks on. Yeah. The other thing I noticed was that, uh, about halfway through trial, I realized that it was significant that my client was masked. Um, I hadn't thought through the benefits and possible detrimental effects of that before the trial. Um, but one thing happened during the trial that made me realize I needed to do some things different because my guy was masked. Um, his, one of his teenage sons was fairly aggressively cross-examined by the defense. Uh, you know, just, you know, did your dad ever complain about back pain before? Just really, really getting after him pretty good. Um, and then just at the end of that examination, we took a break. So we went into the conference room and where, you know, we were generally comfortable removing our masks, my client and I, my, my partner, Corey Ford, uh, when we were in the conference room. Uh, and he took off his mask and I could see he was incensed. He was furious. He was just ready to punch a hole in the wall. And, you know, if he'd been unmasked during the trial, the jury would have seen that. They would have known, they would have recognized that maybe the defense had pushed things a little too far and that this was taking a toll on my client just being there and seeing that. And I realized that they wouldn't have any idea at all. So fortunately, he hadn't yet testified. And when he testified, I made sure I asked him about it. You know, how'd you feel when you were just sitting there two hours ago when you saw your son getting cross-examined like that. And, and you know, he was able to express his, his emotions at the time really well. He was enough removed from it that he was collected in the way he described it. But, he's, but he said, you know, uh, I was so mad. He doesn't deserve that. He only came here to tell the truth. I raised him to be a truth teller and he was here doing that. And for him to be treated like that, uh, it made me so mad that I have to go through this process to get things balanced. And then talk about how he was he decided at that moment that he was not going to have his daughter come testify because he didn't want to have her exposed to that. Uh, it was really powerful testimony, but I would have just let his reaction speak for itself if he hadn't had a mask on. It's so interesting. I, I hadn't 
<clears throat> I hadn't thought about that. It, I think it also, to me, you know, I think back to different trials I've tried and um, that it's a bit of a double-edged sword though, in the sense that there have certainly been times in case I've tried in the past where I wish my client had a mask on their face, yeah, right. given like they're talking or saying things and I'm you know, trying to say, please don't do that. You know, I mean, cause that can backfire. I think in your case, you're right. You would have liked for the jury to see how incensed the dad was at watching his son get improperly cross-examined. But on the other hand, you know, there's going to be those times where, you know, as much as you've coached your, your client about, you know, the jury is always watching you, they still can't help themselves and, you know, mouthing words and things like that, that could really give a bad impression about them. So, and it's also interesting that you like to have your client at the table with you, right? Uh, yeah, I, I haven't always, but yeah, generally I like to have them there. Yeah, I usually, so my, just as an aside, my thinking over time has sort of been, when I first started trying cases, I always had them sitting at the table with me. And then I started to feel one is a distraction. And two, if I could have them sort of placed somewhere else, then there was less of a focus on them. And generally speaking, I always want there to be less of a focus on my client in whichever which manner, uh, my, my personal preference. So the way our trial set up, our, our clients were actually able to sit behind the jury for the most part, uh, which to me was, I think was preferable, but um, I think everyone you have to always just do what's comfortable with you, right? Yeah, and it depends on the client for sure. I mean, uh, uh, there's a lot of smart thinking out there about when not to do it and when to do it. Um, I knew my guy would be able to contain himself generally. Uh, he wasn't gonna be grabbing my shoulder before every third question to suggest something to me. So uh, I, I, was, I could count on him to be there and behave himself. And you sounds like you really had a rock star client. So, you know, that's, that's a real blessing to go try a case with a client like that. Great guy. Look, this, this family was incredible. My job was to not mess up their case. Yeah. <laughs> right. A hundred, get out of the way of a good case. Right. Yeah. Um, so tell me if, was there anything in closing or opening or themes that you worked into the trial um, that were specific to people's experience of the pandemic and living through this presently? Good question. We talked about that a lot. My partner, Corey Ford, and I, uh, probably like most plaintiff's lawyers, spent a lot of time just talking about the case over and over, coming up with concepts, how you're going to how you're going to describe things, what words you're going to use. I think all of that matters. And, and you only get that by talking about it and talking about it. Um, we decided we weren't going to dwell on the pandemic itself. Um, I mentioned it at the very beginning of opening. You know, I told them I was, appreciated them being there. Uh, I knew these were tough times. Uh, they had an important job to do and we weren't going to waste their time about it. And then that was it. Didn't talk about the pandemic the whole rest of the time unless I had to make some comment about my mask getting caught in my glasses or something like that. Sure. Um, but I, one of the real benefits of the court shutdown there early in the spring was that a lot of really good lawyers were kind enough to share their time in webinars and, and other uh, ways uh, and gave me a chance to take a break and really watch those. And one of the best ones I saw uh, was Jim Lee. So, uh, maybe you oh, know. Yeah. yeah. West Virginia guy, right? Yeah, good West Virginia guy uh, talking about how in these times, even as polarized as America is, uh, there's no side of the political spectrum that doesn't value freedoms. They might value different freedoms. You know, one might value the freedom of uh, being able to carry uh, automatic weapon in public. And another might value the freedom from being, you know, uh, unnecessarily accosted by a police officer. But in general, everyone's valuing these freedoms. And so his suggestion was to couch your non-economic damages in uh, terms of freedoms lost. So instead of talking about job modifications required by the injury, we talked about he lost the freedom to, uh, to handle his career the way he wanted to. Instead of talking about his inability to work on his farm uh, and do all the physical labor there that needed to be done, we talked about how he lost the freedom to do what he wanted, when he wanted on his property. Um, instead of talking about 
his, his concern about what the consequences of the surgery might be. We talked about his uh, loss of his freedom from worry. Um, and we hammered that in opening and also in closing. Um, and I don't know if that was the thing that made a difference, but that was a new concept for me and, and all credit for coming up with it goes to Jim. But I, I can tell you that it felt right when we didn't know exactly how this jury pool was gonna be politically because of the limitations on some of the questions. Uh, it felt like that was something that was getting through to everyone. And, yeah. then it, and it fits in with then when you're talking about what's gonna balance the scales, what makes up for what was taken. Um, when you take someone's freedoms, there's not too many people out there who are gonna be unaffected by that. Yeah, nobody likes to have their stuff taken. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I actually just, but just by serendipity, did a, a short video on my YouTube channel about loss aversion, which is kind of the underpinning, you know, cognitive uh, bias that plays into why losses, losing something resonates so much stronger with people than having gained something. If you just think about it in your own life, if someone takes something of yours that you had, it's much, much more significant and impactful to you than even if you gain something of much greater value, potentially. Yeah. It's I interesting think. that it works that way. And then I love, you know, coupling that with, you know, really that constitutional right that everybody can identify with that, you know, freedom to do whatever it is that different, you know, aspects of their life and pointing out that we're all granted that constitutional right. I like, you know, rally a year ago was really stressing that tying, you know, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness mm -hmm. into how you're going to argue your damages model for non-economic damages. And then, you know, the fair trade value, if somebody takes this away from you, what, is, you know, what's the fair price for that? You know, and I think that's great. And I think you and I are both, and a lot of lawyers really fortunate, like you said, if you're junkies about trial practice to have had this, you know, crazy pandemic hit where we were locked in our houses and our, our work processes slowed down, but we had a lot more time to watch this massive amount of trial strategy and, and all these amazing seminars and all this great stuff that got put out online on top and have the time to watch it as well. I mean, there's, yeah. only, there's, there's too much. I can't keep up with it. No, no, but uh, any, any bit of it helps. And, and, you know, because there'd been so much of it there through the spring, I couldn't wait to get in the courtroom. <laughs> it was, uh, I wanted to try those things. So Pete, um, how long did the jury deliberate for? Uh, I would say about 90 minutes, Brendan. Uh, it was, wow. the trial was bifurcated, uh, pursuant to West Virginia statute if punitive damages are an issue. The way it works is you put on your liability and damages case, jury returns a verdict. If they return a verdict that includes compensatory damages, then the judge makes a determination as a gatekeeper whether the liability case was such that punitive damages should be considered by the jury. And if the court believes that they were, then you actually reopen evidence put on evidence specifically for the punitive damages aspect of it. And then the jury goes back out and deliberates that. So, uh, and then we went, we went through that process in this case and the jury uh, deliberated, I'd say about 90 minutes on the compensatory damages and liability aspect of it. And then another maybe 45 minutes on punitive damages. There probably wasn't even 45 minutes on punitive damages. Maybe. Okay. Happened. I want to talk about that in one second. Were there any questions from the jury at any point? None. I was surprised at that. Interesting. Considering how uh, ad hoc some of the trial process went because of the jury always being in the courtroom, I thought for sure they were going to have questions about stuff, uh, but, but there weren't any. Very and a, lot, a lot of the credit for that goes to Judge Hammer for, for being so careful ahead of time in the pretrial procedures to make sure that we had a smooth show to put on once we got in the courtroom. Do your juries get a copy of the instructions? They do. Ah, okay. We don't do that in Pennsylvania for the most part. And tell me, you know, so explain what happened with the compensatory verdict and or the punitives component. Um, 
the jury returned a verdict that included two and a half million dollars in compensatory damages, some of which were lost wages, most of which was uh, non-economic damages, and then went back out uh, on the punitive damages aspect of it and returned with a uh, million dollar punitive damages verdict, apportioned in an interesting way, 250,000 uh, assessed against the drunk driver and 750,000 assessed against the employer, which was frankly something we were concerned about uh, on appeal. Um, it, was, it was an interesting apportionment concerning, concerning that, not what we would have guessed for sure. We, we were not surprised about a punitive damages verdict. We were surprised about the apportionment of it. Wow. So the total verdict was around three and a half million? Three and a half million. Wow. That's absolutely phenomenal. Um, I mean, uh, you don't have to share it if you don't want to, but what was the highest offer? Not close to that. <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 we were right to do what we did. Yeah, absolutely. Our, you know, it, it, helped, it helped having a steadfast client uh, who uh, was proud not in a bad way, but proud of what he'd done. He knew he was telling the truth. He knew he was right. He knew that they had done wrong and he was not going to sacrifice anything out of concern. He trusted his fellow man, trusted the jurors, trusted us, uh, for which we're grateful uh, to go in there and put his case on. And he wasn't afraid of the process. You know, probably everyone in our industries had lots of uh, folks who are nervous about the process and who are, uh, not able to withstand some of the risks of trial, you know, once there's a half decent offer on the table. So uh, they picked the wrong guy to do this to. Well, I mean, congrats to your um, client for, you know, sticking to his guns, but also, you know, he's fortunate to have had, you know, great lawyers and yourself and Corey Ford to have represented them to be capable and qualified to do what you guys did. Cause that's that mm -hmm. even with as great of a client as you have and the great facts, I mean, that is an, a really an, an unusual and exceptionally amazing verdict to, um, to pull out for a client. So it's really, I love hearing stories like that. So Thanks, Pete, Bert. um, you know, as, as we sort of near the end of the interview for those lawyers watching or who will watch this, who are going to try a pandemic case and haven't done so, is there any, you know, advice now that you are seeing the experience from a different vantage point, having tried a case that you would give to people or uh, things to keep in mind that maybe weren't as significant to you ahead of time that are now or things that were that you were planning for and, and played out that way? Good question. Um, there are a lot of little logistical details that you don't necessarily think about uh, and you take for granted that now come into play. Um, this one poor fact witness who's a good friend of our client who lives in Massachusetts, um, he would have done anything for his friend as far as being there for him for trial. But I didn't realize until about two days before the trial that his attendance at trial meant that when he returned to Massachusetts from West Virginia, he was gonna have to quarantine for two weeks. <laughs> so I felt terrible about it. And, and he didn't complain, he was just awesome about it. But I felt horrible that this guy is gonna to come to trial, testify for 30 minutes, I mean max, 30 minutes in the courtroom and then heading back to Massachusetts. And he was gonna to have to quarantine for two weeks. So for out of state witnesses, think about getting videos done, you know, make sure you're protecting those folks so you're not disrupting their life so much. Um, another thing is, is getting, getting food into your body during trial. I don't know how you are. Uh, you look like you've got about the same metabolism as me, man. I get hungry. Um, and there's no courthouse cafeteria that's open right now. There's no corner deli that's really quickly serving food right now is, uh, bring, bring power bars and stuff in your briefcase and, and make sure you're able to get yourself fed and get your client fed because you don't want to fade during trial, it's not as easy to do that as it used to be. And then, and then uh, I don't know what to tell people about the mass jurors other than to do as much research ahead of time on your potential jurors as you can. So at least you know the general outline of what these folks are and who they are. Um, it was helpful to me to have Corey there with me 
who spent a lot of time just watching them uh, in a way that I couldn't, you know, carrying on the trial um, and, and try to take note of who was reacting what way. Because it's really hard to take a quick glance at the jury and see if they're frowning or scowling or smiling or just not paying any attention at all. And then, I mean, how about people that are worried about themselves having to wear the mask during the trial? I mean, do you think it's just grin and bear it or is it become you forget about it after a while or did it, did it bother you? What was your experience overall trying the case? A lot of the times having a mask on. Good question. I, you know, uh, I think we're at the point now where most folks are getting used to it. Uh, you forget about it. Uh, I wear glasses. So you've got the fogging up issue and you just have to try to find your way through that with the proper mask and getting the fit right. I can't help there. <laughs> it's just one of those phenomenons that's going to occur. Um, I would say that I was surprised and heartened a little bit at how comfortable the jury seemed. Um, I'll tell you this, you might think this is funny. You know, we went through all these precautions to keep them safe and social distance and spread out and masks all the time and microphone condoms and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, the jury's in the courtroom. So when they reach a verdict, everybody else trooped in and the jury's sitting there waiting for you when you walk into the courtroom. It was, it was six ladies. They were all sitting in a close little cluster with their masks down, chit-chatting with each other as we walked in. I thought, you know what? People want to be out. They want to be doing this kind of thing. They take it seriously. But the people who are really losing their mind about this are, are pretty small and on the edges uh, of the extreme both ways. Most folks are, are happy to take reasonable precautions but still get about their business. So we can't assume everyone's going to be terrified. We shouldn't be terrified. We should get to it, you know. Yeah, I think that's awesome. And uh, yeah, just to recap, a three and a half million dollar verdict on a non-surgical motor vehicle case. Yes, there were some good aggregating factors, but again, phenomenal outcome. That was so great. Um, Pete, where can people reach you? What's the best way to get in touch with you if they want to talk more about the case or they want you to help them with the case or, or co-counsel or something? Sure. Thanks, Brendan. Uh, WilliamsFordLaw.com is our website. My email address is Peter at WilliamsFordLaw.com. Um, we co-counsel on cases in Virginia and West Virginia fairly routinely. Um, and Beyond that, just like to sit around and talk about cases. So anybody that wants to talk more about what we've been through, happy to share it. I want everybody to go out there and get big verdicts because uh, I don't want the insurance companies to be thinking this is going to be some opportunity for them to take advantage. Amen. Uh, it helps all of us. Yep. You've got it. You've got hey man, it. Congrats again. And thanks again for uh, interviewing here on the uh, Persuasive Lawyer. And I'll definitely be one of those people that uh, hopefully picks your brain or talk shop in the future. It's been awesome uh, getting to meet you. I look forward to it, Brendan. I've enjoyed this. Congratulations on yours as well. And, and keep up the good fight. Mm -hmm.